Welcome to the last sessions for today. Uh, it's a session that we hope will provoke your curiosity and will help us all break through the scourge of fake news, the myriad of information platforms, and the war of opinions. I think you have guessed it right. We're talking about offering you the cherry of the cake of today, the arts and perils of communications. It is my pleasure to welcome on stage three extremely diverse, talented speakers who are doing their bit to build a healthier and a safer tomorrow. If I may ask to, of Joe, Joe Smizer to join me upstage, Joe. Joe is the CEO of a public good project. Gabriella Stern, the Director of Communications of the World Heart Health Organization. <laughs> I'm wired, I cannot pronounce. Uh, I'm only pronouncing hard. <laughs> Gabby. And Marco Barber, who is the CEO of Digital Cuts and consultant in AI and behavior change. Marco. For those who are joining us now and those who are joining us online, I am Buriana Pervan. I am the Director of Strategy and Communications of the World Heart Federation, where our daily job is, uh, comes down to one very simple principle, uh, helping our over 200 members, member organizations, build the vital connection between people's hearts, between their health systems, between their societies, and the plethora of global emergencies that we're facing the world today. All of this is enough to keep us busy, to keep us motivated, and more recently, also keep us awake at night. With this, I will go to my first question, and I would like to ask you to, to give a very brief answer, a very spontaneous one. What keeps you awake at night, and what do you see as humanity's biggest problem of today, starting with Marco? Thank you very much, Boriana. Thank you, everyone, to be here. Um, so, the biggest challenge right now that uh, makes me be on my toes in the morning is actually work and I'm very uh, very happy to be working AI training it's about human machine interaction and how we drive that why I think it's very important because of uh, the speed of change that uh, is the impact on everything good things and also risks hence responsibilities we have so basically, the biggest challenge we have as people, as humans, is to manage that speed of change. Thank you. Gabby? Me as a person? What keeps yes, me awake at person. night? But in, in, your, in your role All as right. director of comp. Right. So as a person, as a person, uh, conflict and war. Um, there's just too much right now. Um, and as in my job as director of communications at the World Heart, no, World Health <laughs> Organization. Um, it's um, the struggle to um, get adequate investment in health at all levels, everywhere. It's, uh, it's baffling that physical and mental health are not top priority for all funders, whether governmental or otherwise, because I don't think I have to preach to you, this preaching to the choir. We are, we are our health, first and foremost, from, from the start, from before the start. So that's what bothers me the most. Thank you. Joe? Um, I think personally it, it's the rise in, the global rise in nationalism and xenophobia. Um, and I think uh, professionally in, in my organization, uh, it's actually the same because we monitor a lot of health conversations in public media data. And that linking between health and nationalism and xenophobia is, uh, has been dramatically exacerbated over the last four years. Thank you. That brings me to, uh, to a very short introduction that I wanted to make, uh, which is that this is the year where we have a massive part of the population voting, eligible to vote. We have four billion people who are eligible to vote, and that's almost half of the world and, and some of the biggest democracies. Yet, there is this rise of hateful narrative everywhere across, across boundaries, and especially on digital, because that's where we see it in, in one go. 
Um, and we have, uh, the, the, the issue is that it's not only the results on an individual level in countries that are important, but how are these you know, political conversations happening across boundaries? Um, and how can we counter all of that? Um, the negative, the hateful narratives tend to somehow come together as if driven by a magnetic uh, invisible threat. Uh, and, and yet we heard also a lot today in today's sessions, us uh, who, are, who are bothered by all of the issues that you mentioned, we work a bit in isolation, or at least that's how it seems. We are you know, more, more working in silos than that. So our narrative is not necessarily coming together uh, in different global, global emergencies, the world. How can we change that? What can be done uh, to, to really get to the bottom of behavior change and, uh, and, and tackling the, the hateful narratives? So I will start actually by, by you, Joe, <laughs> because of, um, of your organization that you are CEO of. Um, which is called uh, Public Good Public Good Projects. Um, if you can tell us about how did you decide to uh, to to found it, uh, but also um, what are the criteria of the projects that you fund, and and what are some examples of such projects? How are they impactful at large scale? Um, so we're not a very old organization. We were founded in uh, 2012. Um, it, it was actually a very popular HBO documentary series uh, in the United States called The Weight of the Nation. It was the first large uh, movie series that talked about obesity in the United States, and it had a community health aspect to it. And a lot of the experts that were interviewed for that series um, became board members. And then we partnered with the Institute of Medicine, or the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine now in the US. Um, and so PGP was formed. I, I call public good projects PGP. It's easier on everyone. Um, and we mostly do cross-sector initiatives. So we work within large health systems. We work with a lot of hospital systems, uh, governments, large health foundations. Um, and so we don't advertise ourselves or uh, solicit donations. So many people haven't heard of us unless you're part of a large health system. Um, in terms of how we work and the relevance of how we work to what we're talking about, in particular to what I just mentioned, the rise in nationalism and xenophobia. I think um, what, what I try and talk about all the time, uh, and it's not an original concept, is there is more misinformation and disinformation on health than there was at the, at the height of the pandemic, much more. So all of the initiatives that we have heard about, all of the cross-sector collaborations, all of the coalitions, they are all very important and we have to do something, but they have not actually solved the problem. They have not made it worse, but they have not demonstrably and substantially impacted the problem. Um, and it's not just the social media companies and it's not just the media companies and it's not just government. It's a thing that we're gonna have to live with now for the rest of our lives. So what that means to me is whether you're in the healthcare and medicine space or whether you're in the public health space, we have to start working more collaboratively as professionals between each other. A lot happens outside of the physician's office and a lot happens in the physician's office. And those two things are often not very connected, even in professional practice. But out in the communities and out in the populations, I think the only thing we can really focus on that has any um, that's scalable and has any hope of mitigating this is the involvement of more community leaders and the involvement of more community organizations and HCPs or healthcare providers starting to be trained in how to communicate more effectively and how to understand behavioral science and behavioral insights in addition to the science that they spent years and years learning so they could practice medicine. I think without doing that, it's gonna be a lot of flash in the pan initiatives, but no real strategy driving anything. Can I be a devil's advocate here? <laughs> um, just looking at all the, the viral comments, um, because nowadays the, the real content is within the comments. <laughs> And it's not, it's not, you know, it's 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 the one that com that comes viral. Um, the viral ones are the ones that are mostly negative and lies. And uh, we had prepared something here from the Economist, but I guess we couldn't bring it up up uh, up the stage. 
uh, but uh, it's all about, you know, if, if you see the, the number of, of AI generated and other uh, complete lies that are spread around and the, 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 the pace that you talked about earlier, we can train all we want. Are we ever going to be on, you know, on the same level or, or do we have a chance of winning a battle if, if we are coming with a constructive content, evidence-based content, um, fact-checking, myth-busting, etc. Does it stand a chance against the, you know, the viral power of this uh, misinformation and disinformation? Um, <laughs> it's a big question. People will always trust nurses and will always trust physicians more than anybody else in terms of health information. If we can't figure out how to scale the impact of trusted health messengers, I think the answer is no. Can I jump in? Yeah, please. One problem. I agree with you that health workforce are by and large trusted, but what, what happens when health workers um, are themselves purveyors of wrong information? And we, we do see that in some places where you have anti-vax health workers and so on. So this becomes quite a problem. And if the virality of mis- and disinformation continues, you'll have new generations of health workers w who are affected themselves by that, e even if they go through um, rigorous training. So that's that keeps me up at night, actually. <laughs> <laughs> We're going back to the key question, Marco. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I comment uh, on that as well, uh, back to what you said that uh, the attacks of misinformation may come in the comments. So there are different types yeah. of uh, attacks. If they are automatically generated, so not being uh, produced by people, but just by machines with uh, hence uh, um, a bad purpose, well, that's definitely bad ones and they should just be removed, deleted. Okay, they can be, mm. because uh, they're just not made by people, they're just with a bad intent. When, uh, when they are made by people, even if uh, these people are wrong, we, they have to be respected, because it's a human belief, it's a human opinion, it's a human sentiment, okay? Uh, of course, if these people are driven because uh, wrong, in they are just wrong, they base themselves on wrong information, that's when there is, um, actually an effort of education to be done, right? And that can be done by mm, organizations that uh, partner together, so they act on this on one voice. Um, but what I wanted to say here is that there's a different types of comments that have to be treated in a different way. Yeah. Could I add one thing too? Yeah. Part of why I said no is what we're seeing in the media data is the individuals, if you are uh, an HCP, if you're a healthcare provider, and you, you are incentivized for some reason to spread bad information, um, objectively false information, provable mm -hmm. false information, unlike in the year 2000 and unlike in the year 2020, you are given a platform today. Yeah. There are politicians that are grabbing on to the nationalism and the xenophobia and co-opting um, public health and healthcare, and they're finding these people and these organizations that are many, they're often very new, and they're giving them a platform in their election or in, in, their, in their speeches to their constituents. So that is a very hard problem for us to solve in public health, and it's actually, it, it's unsolvable for us in public health. Yeah, and, and, and there are different types of misinformation spread by our sector. Some of them are about health interventions, what you should or shouldn't eat and that kind of thing, or what kind of medication, that, you know. Some of it, though, is about our sector. And so it, um, some of these characters, whether they're in the health sector or outside of the health sector, are, are saying false things about how the health system works writ large. So they certainly say, false things about the World Health Organization and our governance and all that, but they say things, similar things about health institutions, scientific institutions, how science is done, how medicine is done in a, in a way that doesn't address specific 
health interventions, health conditions, but uh, is meant to foster mistrust, distrust in what we all do. And that is quite disturbing. And if, if I can just ask you also, Gabby, from your perspective, uh, because before uh, before joining the World Health Organization, you have been with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for, for some time. And before that, you were working 25 years as a journalist at the Wall Street Journal. So how over the years, how have you seen, you know, the the way we interact with audiences and the way uh, information is consumed, how it evolved, what changed, and, and what are the principles that remain the same? Um, yeah, so um, just by way of background, I've been at the World Health Organization a little over five years. Prior to that, I was with the Gates Foundation for about three years. That was my first job outside of journalism. So at age 55, I left journalism, but I had been in, in the news business for since I was 11. I'm 63 now, so you can see. And yeah, I was at the Wall Street Journal for about 25 years in different roles, mostly as an editor uh, in different places and roles around the world. And before that, I was with the Omaha, Nebraska World Herald, which is a wonderful um, regional paper. So I have that in my blood, really. Um, and um, I think that there are, f there are many changes. Fundamentally, though, people have been lying and hurting people through their lies and communicating that for as long as history, right? You know, when, when um, in 2020, when the lies were just erupting about um, COVID and about us and so on, I, I thought a lot about Goebbels, right? So uh, mind control, propaganda, um, and, and many of today's purveyors, political purveyors of disinformation have, are Goebbels-esque, but what they have is our tools that, um, you know, allow them obviously to reach billions of people at, at a moment's notice in a split second, et cetera. Um, so their ability to do damage is, is massive. Um, so that didn't exist certainly when I was coming up. Uh, the news industry, so journalism though is something that um, breaks my heart every day because I do think that, um, that something has changed with journalism and it really is digital news and also the decline, the collapse of the business model in the news business. It has made newsrooms much more um, almost desperate um, to find new ways to monetize their news. And that leads to ha bad habits in capturing the news and headlines and, and, and writing their articles or broadcasting or creating videos and, bro and radio broadcasts. It exaggerates longstanding bad habits. So clickbait, um, that is not new, but the extent and speed of clickbait um, is, is new and it's really pernicious. Um, so I, I do believe that journalists, and if I went back into journalism, I would actually do things very, very differently because the old ways of doing things are often perpetuating mis- and disinformation rather than elucidating truths. And you have seen, I've seen also recently even serious outlets, what I consider how over the years they've changed the ways of communicating, uh, the ways of reaching out to the audience and really some, somehow playing the game of you know, clickbait and deteriorating the quality of the content. So adapting to something that's not necessarily worth perpetuating. Yeah, exactly. That, that is one of the reasons I left journalism. In the end, I was deputy managing editor at the Wall Street Journal, and but my portfolio was very much about digital journalism and trying to f find new revenues and such. And um, it was a personal decision. I just um, felt too alienated in a way from, from the news and from the work. I could have gone back into the field and done news, but I decided to try something else. But it was that hamster wheel that, um, news organizations are on that I just was um, demoralizing me. I just couldn't do it anymore. Com coming back to uh, just uh, the, wor the, the World Health Organization, um, Dr. Tedros had said that the future of health is digital. 
and that uh, WHO does everything to ensure that um, every every country is you know equally rich with with digital tools. How do you do that in practice, and how do you ensure that you stay on message in in every country? So when when Dr. Tedros, the Director General, says that he's talking about the full range of digital tools, so not just communications tools, but also diagnostics, testing, uh, therapeutic, everything, right? Um, surgical use of, of digital, et cetera. Um, and um, as he likes to say, uh, you know, we have 194 member states and the smallest, let's say that's the Cook Islands with maybe 10,000 people, is as important to us as a, as a stakeholder as the largest, and you know who the largest countries are. Um, and fundamentally, we want to help all countries, all populations, all communities access the best digital tools for their health. They have to be um, good partners and they have to put the investment into that, and that, that means making sure that the lowest income, most marginalized, remote populations have the same access to these things as we do in big cities and wealthy places. Um, in communications, from, the, from my profession, I think digital is magic. Um, even though it has fostered bad habits in journalism and so on and so forth, it's amazing because we can, you know, as with in COVID or when MPOX happened or anything, we can, um, it makes it a lot easier than in the old days when you had to fax a press release <laughs> or, um, you know, anything that was very low, low um, tech and low reach. So it's really great for us. Marco, maybe uh, coming to you with your experience a bit of a, as a more uh, an expert and a provider of knowledge to different international organizations and companies based here in Geneva. Um, what is, how do you see, what is the level of preparedness that international organizations have when it comes to, you know, at cyber attacks or how the, the deciphering false from true information using AI tools? Okay, if you allow me, I just add one point to, to yours and coming back to your first question, what are the most important uh, major things for humanity right now, I think uh, is also um, uh, inequality. In, uh, in access to resources, so that's including health, and that's why digital is a major solution, because we bring the communications first, the education, and also the solutions, okay? So, so that's a very, very uh, good potential. And coming back uh, to your question now, uh, are we ready for a cyber attack uh, <laughs> in, uh, in Geneva? Of course not. Uh, because in cyber attack, um, there's no s nothing like risk zero. So it's not a question if you will be attacked, but when. Um, so you have to be pre you have to stay prepared, and the objective is to minimize the impact of the attack. And uh, basically, you prepare at uh, three levels. So there is uh, systems. We tend to be okay on that, so it's uh, software and hardware, it's firewalls, it's antiviruses and everything. Then there is a people, and then there is uh, processes. So with people, that's where the biggest vulnerability is generally. So people are tracked with, uh, trapped with um, human calls, like telephone calls to get access information or things like that. And processes means formalizing, documenting um, um, situations and processes. For example, international organizations, they have travel, travelers. Their employees travel a lot in different uh, regions of the world, in different airports, train stations, remote areas, etc. So the connection, the connectivity will be different. So the security as well. So they know they need to be aware of where they stand and how to connect and how to react if there's a problem then. That's for cybersecurity. And what, what AI tools are you using to, uh, to filter information? To? To filter information. To filter information. Well, it depends uh, of the context. Um, it depends of uh, the objective. Um, actually, I'm a trainer more to create in gen AI, so it's more to create, to produce contents and I educate in that sense 
how to create it interacting with the machines. Um, and then, of course, doing that right, the people also learn how to consume information, like to distinguish what is right from what is wrong or how to do that, hence how to filter. So, of course, there are tools that you can uh, find uh, easily. You can ask ChatGPT the list, the top 10, uh, or in Google you can find them and test them, and some are free and easy to use. Uh, but it's also very much about methods of use interacting with this uh, artificial intelligence and LLM tools. Thank you. Um, I think we have, this is the remaining time here, three minutes. So uh, we're gonna <laughs> open the, if you, if you don't give me more, I don't know because I wasn't here uh, during the quiz. Just to know where, I, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so before, before we open the floor for, for questions, which I'm sure that there will be, um, from the audience, uh, I just wanted to go back to you, Joe, and um, you know, if, if if your organization is aimed at changing um, behavior and implementing change just for the for the public good and health related, can you give us some examples, specific examples where this has this was successful, and examples that maybe we can learn from in the cardiovascular space? Um, yeah, I so the most effective. Um, behavior change uh, programs I've seen that, that are health in the health communication space are first evaluated. Most big health promotion campaigns are not evaluated. They're given to an agency and the agency tells you how many impressions and clicks you got for your millions of dollars and they have no idea if any actual change occurred in terms of a health outcome. We have to stop doing that. That is wastes of billions of dollars every single year on every single health topic. We have to take the power away from agencies and put it back in public health organizations. Um, and when you graduate with a degree in health communications or public health, you have absolutely no idea how to interact with the modern media landscape. You know a lot about behavior change theory, you know absolutely nothing about media and communications. And those are at the top tier one universities. So where I've, where I've taught. <laughs> Um, so we have to actually, need an, we need an entirely new paradigm shift for how health communications works. Are, how are you going to evaluate it? And you cannot get away with telling me that you can't evaluate it. You always have to evaluate it. And second, if your approach is how big is your media buy, then you are all, you've already failed. If you are not integrated with, with vast networks of community organizations, vast networks of community leaders, community influencers, whatever you want to call them, then what you're creating is just a problem that's perpetuating. There's no sustainability, there's no scalability, and there's certainly going to be no impact. So, but that idea that I just shared sounds perhaps like common sense to many of you. It is not common sense in our large health, large and small health organizations. Um, the, only thing, the other thing I'd just like to mention is we need a paradigm shift as well in how we think of ourselves as healthcare and public health professionals. A lot of the people that are being given platforms by xenophobic and nationalistic politicians today have the same degrees, the same letters after their name that all of you do and that I do. And so I, we have to decide as a community of practice within healthcare and public health, where is the line that we are drawing? because we have a lot of people gleefully watching the destruction of our institutions that gave them the credibility to get on Twitter and get lots of followers, but we have not figured out as a society and as a community of practice, are, what, are the, what are the ramifications for, for this? What, is the, what happens to this person? What happens to this organization that is doing this? Um, and I don't have the answer, but I think that's a really big question that we need our medical boards and our schools of medicine to actually come up with an answer for. Yeah, <laughs> we cannot agree more. <laughs> and I think that's a big part of, uh, of, of, of the reason we exist as an umbrella organization, I, to try to, to break that. I want to disagree with one thing, which is, um, and maybe it just is because of my experience being different from yours. I'm not sure the problem is when you outsource a health campaign to an agency or something. I think the problem is, as you say, that who is the lack of measurement and evaluation. Um, and anyone who is making any kind of communicate, health communications product needs to commit to setting goals and then seeing if you achieved your goals. Um, and 
because you know, as much as you, when you were saying, oh, the, the investment should go back into organizations and to communications, I felt like saying yes, but it's also not realistic, right? So we will always, we, the sector, will always have to um, develop communications products and campaigns through in-house and also getting them from other vendors because sometimes the vendors will have skills you won't have, you'll yeah. never have in-house and so on. But uh, the other thing I think is um, the shift that you're talking about has to happen, but it, it will have to happen in parallel. We're going to have to do two things at once. We're going to have to keep doing what we're doing. We have to fight like hell, I say, against the, um, the and do hand-to-hand -hand combat against the lies, even as we are completely re-engineering how we develop um, communications products and campaigns. Um, sometimes um, one is tempted to just say we need to stop um, communicating and develop a, a behaviorally based, measurable things, um, but it's not realistic. And some of it, the reason it's not realistic is largely because when you're, because one's leadership and one's stakeholders and one's partners will not let you do that, right? So. When something happens, the first thing a communications shop is asked to do is, well, the question is, what are we going to do? How are we going to communicate? So, um, so there's a there's an odd um, inertia happening where you we're going to have to continue doing what we're doing, and then learn in parallel how to do it better. I know it sounds kind of obvious, but this is a profound thing that has to happen. I have a question, maybe then I'll give you first the floor to you, Marco, to, uh, to answer the question. Um, experts, uh, 1,400 experts on security, uh, recently told the World Economic Forum uh, that disinformation and misinformation were the biggest global risks in the next two years, even more dangerous than war, extreme weather, or inflation. Do you agree with this? With no. <laughs> because, of course, the most dangerous thing is war, is death, but indeed uh, misinformation uh, can lead to that, as we've seen, uh, whether in purpose or not. Uh, so it's very important to indeed uh, track information, right, and uh, feelings, it's called like that. And uh, sometimes we have peaks of uh, complotist uh, theories that emerge, and so we can see those peaks, and they can be of different intensities, of course. Uh, but it, when it becomes alarming is when you have multiple peaks actually raising at the same time. They can be of different topics, but somehow close, similar. And when they connect, then you have a massive problem, right? And that is when you have indeed to counterattack uh, with, uh, with truth, to, to calm down all these things. I think uh, some call it debunking techniques, but uh, of course it's about uh, measuring, it's about uh, watching all this and uh, reacting as early as possible. Thank you. Gabby, what do you think? Well, it was, it they was, were saying it was the, disinformation it, it is was the, the biggest, biggest risk. problem. Yeah, the biggest risk also for the next two years and that outweighs the risks of war and climate disaster. No. I mean, I think it's poverty, it's conflict, it's the deprivation of rights, it's inequitable access to the most fundamental health tools. Um, but, you know, it's clear that disinformation is an accelerant for many of these um, terrible underlying situations, right? And, and as, as Joe said, um, Certainly inequity and neglect of the poorest, uh, most vulnerable people is, that neglect is fed and fostered and nourished by xenophobia, nationalism, the decision to not care about other people. Um, and we see that now with a number of neglected um, situations. I'm just thinking of Sudan or northern Ethiopia or many places where people are really suffering and you don't see um, investment, financial or even 
invest, investing from the heart in those people. And it's millions of people in, in Sudan. Something like 8 million people have been displaced, at least 8 million people. Thank you. Talking about care, let's care about our audience and just give them. I'll give. I'll, we'll have time just for one question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Hi, Go Sydney ahead. Halbardier from Amgen. Um, earlier in the session, we talked a little bit about leaning on trusted sources like nurses and physicians um, to combat that misinformation. But with the proliferation of deep fakes uh, that are ever more convincing, how do we empower the public to recognize? Um, you know, what a trusted source even looks like anymore. Do you want to take it, Joe? Oh, sure. Um, I think it's going to get harder. It, it's going to get a lot harder. But people will always have people that they trust, and they will always have organizations that they trust. So I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I think it's about rethinking how what capacity building it means and what health system strengthening means. And if we... we Public health organizations need to start thinking about being much more, having much more situational awareness, being much more nimble in their communications. I'm so tired of the FAQ pages on, on health department pages that have not been updated in six years. You know, so, and having one person who's allowed to speak and all of this nonsense that is totally irrelevant anymore. Um, so people are getting information through a fire hose directed at their face about any health topic that we that anyone cares about. And so we have to empower trusted messengers through health literacy programs, media literacy programs. They need a line that they can call to someone who knows the answer. We need much more of a networked approach to health communications. And that's what I uh, keep coming back to uh, myself. Um, yeah, it's gonna get a lot more complicated. So, so Look for the people who are trying to help and empower those people. Amen to that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we don't have more time. Okay. <laughs> but thank you, and that is a, that is a great f finishing line. <laughs> I'll, tr I'll try to be tough. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>